right, so good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing nature, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I am particularly excited because this marks the end, the final program of our epic Nature for All series. So for the last three days, we have done 10 programs with scientists and explorers around the globe, sharing their stories all about bringing people into nature, making sure it's accessible to all, making sure that we have a nature to go to over the next generation to come with some amazing conservation efforts and so much more. I am so thrilled today to wrap up the festival with Human and Nature Connections with Dr. David Galbraith. So he is the head of science at the Royal Botanical Garden, one of the most innovative, uh, fantastic organizations really coast to coast across Canada. They joined us for an incredible Indigenous webinar not too far back, and I'm so excited to wrap up with them today. So Dr. David is going to talk to us a little bit about his amazing work, his career in science and human interconnectedness with the wild, the work of the Royal Botanical Garden, and so much more. And so I'll stop talking. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Galbraith. And uh, thanks so much for joining us today, David. Take us away. Well, yeah, hi, Jesse, and good afternoon or good morning or good evening, wherever you are, everybody. I'm so glad, uh, so grateful to be here with this uh, program. It's so fantastic. Uh, I've known Jesse for a while through our various connections to organizations like the Explorers Club. And uh, so this is just lovely to be in on this special, uh, really special event. Uh, what I'm going to try to talk about today, and I hope it's going to be interesting and not really boring, um, not so much about myself, but about how I've viewed the relationship between people and nature changing over time over the years I've been working. I finished my education um, 30 years ago and I've been doing various things ever since. And 30 years ago, things were enormously different in the way that we viewed nature. I think we viewed nature as something way over there in the corner that we would protect and not try to interfere with. And today, I think everybody that's spending a lot of time working on conservation and studying nature is seeing that we have to bring people and nature together much more for everybody's good. So um, uh, just making sure I can actually advance my slides. There we go. Uh, so I'm speaking to you from Royal Botanical Gardens. We're at the western tip of Lake Ontario. And I'm actually in the, the offices of RBG in the city of Burlington. And I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. This is a statement that we often give if we're in a meeting to acknowledge that the land that we're on is the traditional territories of indigenous communities, indigenous peoples, and that we have really important relationships with the land that um, are, are part of our everyday life here, but also part of what we have to pay attention to. So I would like to acknowledge the long history of First Nations and Métis people in the province of Ontario and pay respects to the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation the treaty and rights holder for the lands stewarded by RBG. I'm speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat nations. All of these places, all these names have long histories going back centuries. And although I'm a biologist and I love studying wildlife, I also am deeply moved by the history and trying to understand how we got to where we are today and maybe how we can do a better job in the future. I want to begin by saying a few words about what a botanical garden is, because maybe you haven't been to one yet. Um, most people, when they think of the word botanical garden, they might think of a place where you can go and see really beautiful plants, uh, walk around outside or walk around inside a great big conservatory or a garden under glass. And that's how the public tends to see what a botanical garden is. But botanical gardens are a little bit more. We actually are a place where the public comes to see things, but also we have people dedicated to science and education and conservation who are working to keep the plants going and to help people make connections with plants. Um, this is a, a, a fantastic thing to be doing. There are botanical gardens all over the world. There's about 2,500 or 3,000 botanical gardens. And although they're all very different, they all are trying to get people to get excited about plants 
And that's hard because most people actually are more excited about things like animals. But how weird is this? Here's a plant from Africa called Wilwichia mirabilis. It's actually growing in some little pots in Edinburgh, Scotland, at a botanical garden there. This plant is so weird that its scientific name includes the word miracle, mirabilis. It has a little underground stem and just two leaves, but the two leaves keep growing forever. An amazing desert plant. Botanical gardens and arboreta and all kinds of things like that. We really try to reach out to the public and not just show, show them something beautiful, although that's, I think, a huge part of what we do. We try to let them know what's going on behind the scenes. A lot of plants are rare and endangered, and I'm going to mention that in a minute. But here's an example of a sign at the University of Guelph Arboretum. And I think there's a classroom online from Guelph today. Hi, guys. Um, the Arboretum at the University of Guelph is a fantastic place for taking care of rare trees. They have a whole collection of rare trees. And this is the kind of information you can find if you walk around at the Arboretum. It tells about this wonderful plant called a pig nut hickory. Botanical gardens also get involved in research. Our origins as organizations go back to the 16th century and people trying to study plants and understand them. And here's a great example of this. Here's a little plant also growing at that garden in Scotland um, in, a, in a careful research facility. Nobody knows what this is. These little plants were collected at an, in, a, in, a, in a desert in Africa and they're growing them carefully at the Botanical Garden in Edinburgh so they can start looking at them over time and figuring out what they are. But we don't even know what some of these things are yet. That's how exciting, that's how new botany is. There's always plants being discovered. Now, plants are central to biodiversity and biodiversity is everywhere. We might think about whales and birds and mammals and insects as biodiversity, but plants are right in the heart of it as well. Plants are integral to our understanding of life on Earth. Now, that life on Earth is not evenly distributed. This is a map of the globe. And across the equator and the southern areas from the northern hemisphere, the northern hemisphere from northern areas from the southern hemisphere, across the middle, you can see the darker blue and reddish colors. These are the places on Earth with the most plants. And they're places like China and Asia, um, the big islands, Borneo, Sumatra, in the Americas on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, countries like Ecuador, Brazil, Colombia, uh, and Mexico have very high number of plant species. These are high diversity areas. As you get further north, you find fewer and fewer plants. Canada is uh, a very high northern country. We've got wonderful plants, but not nearly as many as you find further south. But biodiversity is everywhere. I love biodiversity in cities. If you walk around in a city, you'll see, look carefully at the sidewalk. In a lot of places, you'll see little plants growing up through the, the, the panels of the sidewalk or in cracks. You'll see deer in parks. You'll see birds everywhere. Biodiversity is not just in wild places, in cities too. And cities can be wild. So what is biodiversity? Well, it's variation. And biologists tend to talk about it as in three ways. There's variation among ecosystems. So a desert is different than a forest. A forest is different than a wetland. And there's variation among species. How many species are there out there that you can name? Maybe dozens, maybe even hundreds. That'd be amazing. There are many different kinds of plants and animals out there. And there's variation within species as well. Each one of you guys, unless you're twins, identical twins, are genetically different from everybody else on Earth. We're all genetically diverse, and that diversity within a species is important too. But the, the sheer number of things that we know about now that are living on planet Earth is mind-boggling wonderful. There are about 400,000 species of plants on Earth. That is a very, very, very big number. It's hard to express how hugely big it is. If you were to take all of the birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, and amphibians and put them together, those are the vertebrates. There's about 60,000 of those. And we, human beings, are just one species in that 60,000. Now, take a look at that number of plants, right? There's 
about seven times as many plant species as there are vertebrate species. There's over a million insect species on Earth and maybe over a hundred million viruses. Now, of course, we're in the middle of the COVID pandemic and viruses are, very, are scary sounding. There's only about 30 or 40 viruses that make people sick. Most of these viruses actually interact with other species and the hundred million is a guess. All these numbers mean is that there's so much wonderful diversity on Earth to try to understand and protect and love. It's not just about how many species there are, it's also what's called biomass, which is how much stuff is there. If you can take all of the animals and plants on Earth and add up how much they weigh, you would find that there is about 550 billion tons, or what are called gigatons, of carbon inside the living things on planet Earth. And plants are 90% of that, about 450 gigatons, billion tons of carbon in the world's plants. That's much more than the bacteria or, I've got bacteria on that, cal that list twice, I'm sorry, or fungi or anything else. And we're tiny in terms of our mass, of course. Um, we don't weigh all that much compared to the plants. So you can talk about species. There's a lot of plant species. And you can talk about how much plant there is. And plant is a lot. Plants are also really beautiful and exciting. Uh, here's an example of an endangered plant in Canada called the wood poppy. Uh, yeah, again, I don't know what you guys think of when, if you hear the word endangered species. Maybe you'll think about pandas um, or uh, caribou or um, if you know uh, more about uh, wildlife, maybe things like the Vancouver Island marmot. But we have as many endangered plants in Canada as we have endangered animal species. Botanical gardens are part of trying to save some of those. In fact, of that uh, 400,000 species of plants on Earth right now, we think a quarter of them are threatened with extinction. About 100,000 plant species right now are endangered. And some of those are actually plants that we can use, and maybe we're missing something if they go extinct. Um, again, don't worry too much about all the long words on this chart. This is just a list of a few plant families. Um, if you had broccoli recently, you had a crucifer. If you had a bean, you had legumes, carrots, and so on. These are all different families of plants. You know, of the of the three thousand species of plants on Earth that are like mustard and uh, broccoli, twenty five percent of those are endangered right now. Among the palm trees, thirty percent are endangered right now. That's scary, and that's happening because people largely are having to use the the land for something else the habitat's disappearing. Climate change is also a problem too. There's many ways to protect plants and uh, people are trying all kinds of things. Protecting natural areas is really important. Uh, actually helping individual populations is really important. And we can do exciting things with plants like store them as seeds. Uh, so one thing that's happening all over the place are seed banks. These actually happen to be at uh, Missouri Botanical Garden in, in the USA, it's near St. Louis. But you can take many seeds and you dry them out a little bit and you keep them cool and they'll last for years in that form. And that's a great way of holding on to examples of a species if the plants in the wild are under some kind of threat. Now about 80% of species of plants can be stored this way. They don't last forever, but they can last a long time. So we like to say that all life depends on plants. People don't necessarily think about them very much, but I certainly think that protecting plants should be something we all try to do as a society. They give us so much and they are so much of life around us. And there's even a thing that some psychologists are thinking about now, some doctors are thinking about that if you stay away from the outdoors, if you're inside all the time and you're away from plants, you can get something that's called nature deficit disorder. Being outside and especially interacting with plants is a great way to feel better. 
the practical aspects of plants are huge. Over 9,000 species of plants worldwide are used as medicines today. Many of these in places like India and China, but also uh, in North America, for example, uh, the indigenous people of North America still use an awful lot of the plants that are in the landscape as part of, medic of medicines and cultures. And one of my jobs at RBG has been helping indigenous communities in our area to reconnect with their plants, to help them uh, understand what's out there, um, not trying to interfere with, in with traditional knowledge, but giving, making sure that the tradition, that the indigenous communities have access to Western science if they want that information. There's over 6,000 species of plants used around the world for food. You know, if you go to a grocery store, you'll see what looks like a whole bunch of plants. You'll see apples and pears and uh, onions and carrots and all kinds of things. But if you add up all those species, there's under 100 species in the grocery stores, probably less than that. And most of the calories that people eat in the form of plants comes from a few plants like rice and wheat. But there's so many out there that we can eat and that are used in different cultures, in different places. There's such richness in the world of plants that's directly important to us because we have to eat every day. I certainly like doing it. People can also help restore nature when there's a problem. And this is huge. Um, we do have lots of problems that, that human society is creating. We need a lot of space for ourselves. That's perfectly normal, perfectly good. But we don't want to push nature out. And what's really nice is that there are lots of projects available. People are doing projects to restore nature. Even small projects in people's backyards is absolutely fantastic. And even doctors are now, this is quite new, writing prescriptions for people to get outside. It makes you better, it makes you feel better, it's ha happier and healthier to do so. So uh, this photograph is actually one of our trails at Royal Botanical Gardens, where we have about 20 kilometers of nature trails. We love it when people get outside because they're enjoying nature, they're enjoying the landscape, and we know it makes them feel better. But there's a problem with Western science, and I don't want to shy away from it. I'm a scientist. I grew up uh, in Ontario. I went to University of Guelph and Queen's University. I'm trained as a scientist. And my family is of European descent. My ancestors came over to North America or, or Turtle Island uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. And they brought their culture with them. And that culture has changed, but science is somewhat the same. A lot of science has come uh, through Europe and has developed attitudes about nature that sometimes I think now are a problem for us. A lot of science has led to the idea that people are separate from nature and people are not separate from nature. Nature is everywhere and people are everywhere. For millennia, most of North America, the plants and animals were managed by indigenous people. Maybe it was very subtle, but in some places they had farms. In some places they moved seeds around. Um, they worked with, the, with wild animals. Um, and it's normal, it's natural to have people part of all these habitats. What's happened, though, is there's been something that's now being called fortress conservation, which is the idea that a national park or a big provincial park should not have people living in it should not have people interfering with the other species. And while nature is really important and should largely be left to do its own thing, people have been part of that and to keep people out is actually being seen as a problem now. Western science is the idea that we can look at nature, we can look at ourselves and come up with objective answers to questions that everybody should be good with. Um, you know, I, I know that in the 1950s, people found out that DNA was what allowed individual cells to reproduce and make proteins. That's a universal kind of answer. Scientists say that's everywhere. Um, but that's only one way of looking at the world, to assume that what I would say is correct for everybody 
I would hope I've got the right answer to things, but I can't assume it. Now, Western science goes way back to Greece and had all sorts of other influences, but it's now become practiced worldwide. And sometimes that's pushed us into situations that aren't so good. On the other hand, there are many cultures around the world with different ways of seeing the world and different ways of understanding it. And for cultures that are have grown up for thousands of years on the land, these are indigenous cultures. And indigenous knowledge is another wonderful way of understanding the world. It comes from a different kind of place. Indigenous knowledge comes from stories people tell each other and really practical experience over lifetimes and generations. And it comes from the land and relationships between people too. Indigenous knowledge, and this is really high level generalization, and coming from me who is a Western scientist, but who respects indigenous knowledge, is personal. So I might speak to a friend of mine from one of the local indigenous communities who may have an idea that's different from mine. And it might be different than somebody else you'd speak to. That's fine. I can respect that because that's his knowledge or her knowledge. Indigenous knowledge is also different from Western science because it tends to be oral culture. It tends to be spoken. And Western science is often written down quite different things in the long scheme of it. Now, as we've been exploring this, and this is something that in the last 10 years has really changed my way of looking at things as a scientist, is we understand Western science is missing things. Um, we're missing the holistic view of, human, of humanity's role in nature. We're not separate from nature. And science has often discounted other ways of knowing and indigenous knowledge. And that's really unfortunate. And I think we're changing, but it's a long, long path to get people to change their ideas. Now, there are ways into this, like the science of ecology is all about relationships between organisms. And that gets us into areas of thought and, and study that are very similar to some things that come out of indigenous knowledge. What's also nice is that we, when we get people who are the practitioners of traditional knowledge together with practitioners of Western science, there's a lot of common ground. There's a lot of things we share. Maybe there are some attitudes and ideas that are different between indigenous knowledge and Western science. But in my view, and I work a lot with relationships among organizations, the most important thing to do is not to try to figure out why you're different. The most important thing you can do is find out what you can share. What is your common ground? And one of the biggest shifts that's taken place in the last 20 or 30 years is away from the idea that human beings are on top of everything, especially men. And this is called an anthropocentric point of view. An ecocentric point of view puts people in relationship with all of the life on earth. And that's where science is going too. Our indigenous friends have been there a long time before us. We also have to be really honest about the fact that Western science and Western culture uh, has done some stuff that isn't so great. You know, Canada started off as a British colony and a French colony. And part of colonization has been in the, in the past and it's still happening, taking things away from indigenous and traditional cultures. We have to recognize what's called colonialism or appropriation. We have to be conscious of it and we have to try to take it apart. Different people have different ideas and their knowledge is their own. Just because I'm a scientist doesn't mean I can take somebody else's knowledge away. Now what's really exciting is that in different places, people are coming up with ways of bringing the two together. One expression of this is called two-eyed seeing. Uh, which is a Mi'kmaq idea. And two-eyed seeing has come about when people have been looking at how to take care of things like fish resources, um, fisheries management. And what they're finding is that they can do a better job of taking care of a natural resource when they bring people with Western science knowledge and people with indigenous knowledge together so they can share and they can look at a practical challenge like taking care of uh, a fish population and actually make progress together. 
this is quite different from the way science has often worked in the past couple of centuries where we've often assimilated other knowledge. Um, an old idea would be that Western science people would come in and they'd just take away the knowledge and they go on doing whatever they, whatever they want. What we're working toward now, and it's becoming policy in a lot of places, it's becoming really important in a lot of places, is getting together around knowledge, sharing what people want to share, but also respecting that we're not sharing everything with each other. Now, this is emerging in some really exciting ways. One of them are called indigenous protected and conserved areas. And these are places uh, now across Canada and around the world where indigenous communities, so in Canada, First Nations, Métis and Inuit are actually leading the work to conserve the land, um, often in conjunction with Western science or governments but that indigenous leadership is becoming a thing in Canada, and it's really exciting to see. Some organizations have been doing exciting work for a long time too. Like I love the Toronto Zoo's Turtle Island Conservation Partnership, where um, over the past decade and more, uh, they've been working with Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee experts in Ontario to inform people about wildlife, about things like turtles. There's a, um, a, a a screen cap of one of their information sheets that's written in Mohawk or frogs. This one happens to be written in Ojibwe uh, in Anishinaabe Um Organizations like a zoo or a botanical garden can reach out and form partnerships and be involved in sharing without appropriating. Our big project at Royal Botanical Gardens is our Anishinaabe Trail the journey to Anishinaabe knowledge. You can come to one of our trails at RBG. It's about a kilometer and a half long. And you can walk around and see information that has been shared for the public by uh, the Ojibwe community, by the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and by some friends uh, like Joseph, who I'll introduce in a minute, from Manitoulin Island. So we're trying to share with everybody who comes to visit information about plants. And this is the first case that we have, and this was opened up four years ago, where we're trying to work in partnership with indigenous communities and indigenous people to let them tell the story they want to tell so that they can share what they want to share. It's an interesting challenge because the language of science is different from the indigenous languages that you might find around us. The way we think of things is different, but that's okay. As a scientist, I don't need to run around saying, I'm the only one who knows things. Everybody has their own experiences. Everybody has their own culture. And that is beautiful and incredible and fantastic. This is just the beginning for a place like RBG. Along that trail, for example, you see little plaques on our trees, which we have all over the place. But on, that, on, that, on those plaques, we actually have the names of the plants in five languages. We have them in English and French, and we have the scientific name, if, if that counts as a language. And we have Anishinaabemowin, and we have Ganyankaha, which I probably spelled wrong, I'm sorry, I said wrong, the Mohawk language. We're beginning to ask how can we share this information if people want to share it, to bring people back to the point that this knowledge is so important, that indigenous knowledge about nature is so important, and it makes everything so rich. In the end, this is what we're all trying to do. We're trying to get everybody to love and understand nature. Over 40 years ago, um, uh, a, a, an ecologist from Africa said, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we have been taught. So for somebody like me as a scientist, I want to reach out. I want to share, share with people the excitement and the beauty not just of nature, but of the cultures we all have, of our knowledge, because that's where the future is. It's getting together and it's working together and it's sharing. So I'm so grateful for uh, Jesse to have a chance to say hi to you guys today. And I hope I've left a little bit of time for questions. So back over to you, Jesse.
David, thank you so much for such a beautiful and thoughtful program today. That was wonderful. If you want to come out of screen share, see us again, have a bit of a conversation. I know you've got two monitors. So you're good to go. Miss Nagel's class, our aforementioned Guelph folks, they're joining us live today. So welcome into Miss Nagel's class. You guys have asked a bunch of great questions. If anyone else would like to share, please do. And in fact, I'm going to kick off with one from them. Uh, your talk covered so many different facets of this story that uh, you know we could go all day with questions. Yeah. Uh, they wanted to start with, or Alexa wanted to start with, what got you so interested in plants personally? I'm, I'm curious too. Wow, great question. Thank you, Alexa. Um, my my own studies in university actually, actually were more about animals. Um, I went to University of Guelph and I went to the zoology. We used to have a zoology department, which is all about animals. And uh, my own scientific studies were mostly in the early years all about turtles. You might see a uh, actually over here. There's a there's a shell from a snapping turtle right up there. Um, but when I was looking around at the turtles, the first thing you realize is that the turtles aren't alone. The turtles are surrounded by plants. And uh, even years ago, when we were looking at the turtles in Algonquin Park, we were doing things like trying to figure out which plants were around them when they were laying their eggs, because the condition of the soil and the temperature is really important. So some plants are more shady, other plants not so much. So I, I first started paying attention to plants a long, long time ago in university. Um, I came to Royal Botanical Gardens in 1995 and, and have been here since then to start to get the botanical gardens to talk to each other more about conservation. And um, that was the beginning for me of delving into both the world of plants and also what these kinds of institutions can do. And so it's been a long kind of path for me to understand more and more about plants over time. You never stop learning. You never stop studying. For me, a huge part of studying is just talking to other people and sharing their passion and their knowledge. So um, I've been a latecomer to plants, but when I get when I start thinking about the numbers I was sharing with you guys, 90% of everything that's alive on Earth is a plant. And if you're concerned about the future of life on Earth, climate change, people, everything else, start with the plants. That is fantastic. It's so rare that we get people involved in botany on this program. It's so, so nice. I mean, we have the privilege of having so many conservationists on, so it's nice to have a different tack on that. And I think our class is appreciated as much as I do. I'm curious, actually. So, you know, you are a scientist. You've had the opportunity to work in a, a, an atmosphere where you're surrounded by this at all times. Now, of course, the simple answer to this question is to come to the Royal Botanical Garden. But how would our classes today get learn more about plants, get involved with that? What resources would you recommend or ways that they could keep the learning going? Great question, thank you. I'd start by looking around you. Um, you know, if you're in Southern Ontario, if you're somewhere near Hamilton or Burlington, you could come to RBG and we'd love to see you. If you're in Guelph, you can go to the University of Guelph Arboretum and talk to the people there and see the plants. For me, it's always important to talk to the people as well as seeing the plants because the people are the things that get passionate. I can get jumping up and down about things, but if you talk to a plant, it's just gonna sit there, I'm a plant, okay, admire me. But people get excited. Um, if you're out in British Columbia, for example, there's fantastic gardens out there. You can go to the University of British Columbia Botanical Garden in Vancouver. If you're on Vancouver Island, you can go to Tofino, where there's a lovely botanical garden, or the beautiful big display garden in Victoria um, called the Bouchard Gardens. In Quebec, there's magnificent gardens, Montreal Botanical Gardens, uh, uh, Jardin de Matis in Montjoly, and in Halifax, there's the public gardens. People who are interested in these things already have built these gardens. And a great way to learn is to go there and find out what they're doing. Take a class, take a seminar, just talk to people, walk around. There's wonderful online resources uh, that you can dig around and find. But for me, it's always seeking out the people who are already excited and getting, getting a high off of them. How can, you, how can you find out what excites them? That's a great way to start. It certainly is. And I love the idea of getting out in nature as well. This is something that we really embody as an organization. You know, we do virtual broadcasts. We love the power of virtual education to reach people around the world, but nothing beats going outside. It's something that we we all encourage our, our students to do, teachers to do. We do every single day. You know, you can get out and explore and find so, so much. And if you come to love something through direct experience, uh, you will be inclined to seek out those people that are doing that work. You'll 
joining on broadcast. You'll assess those resources, all sorts of great stuff. So again, a very thoughtful answer. Thank you for that, David. Um, I'm curious, again, Miss Nagel's class, all sorts of great questions. You got them on turtles. And in fact, in general, uh, their question from Brent is, how can we improve the quality of life for turtles? You talked about this plant-turtle connection, but uh, how can kids get involved in conservation? You guys at the Botanical wow. Garden are doing such a great job with educating on this. So I'm curious what our kids can take away. Uh, again, fantastic question, guys. Thank you. Um, uh some people have turtles as pets and i'm not a big fan of turtles as pets because i think they're wild animals and they should be uh in nature that's a personal preference uh, i'm not trying to 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 change anybody's point of view um in general turtles require very few things but they most of them need water um and other life around them to eat like snapping turtles people think of them as eating animals but most of what they eat are, is vegetation so turtles need fresh water in our area they need healthy aquatic vegetation they need a habitat where they have access to things like fish and invertebrates many turtles when they're young actually eat small animals aquatic invertebrates that live around them um a real huge problem for turtles is that many of them will come out of the water and walk around and unfortunately they run on they get up on roads and get run over and so keeping turtles away from roads is really important there's it's hard for individuals to do this um, but there are some organizations out there that help by putting up fences to keep turtles off of roads or working on underpasses where the turtles can go under the roads so I can't give you a universal answer because every place is going to have something different. Uh, in Ontario, Toronto Zoo does some wonderful work. In, in the Peterborough area, there is a whole turtle rescue program going on. Um, too many individual things to mention, but uh, look around to see who is doing turtle rescue work, for example, um, and uh, check out your local naturalists club. Hamilton or Guelph, for example, has wonderful, wonderful naturalist clubs that can help you make those connections. Yeah, I, I, honestly, we could talk all day about this. You talked about overpasses too. Uh, Yellow, Yellowstone to Yukon. So Aaron Jacob was on yesterday at the Nature for All Festival talking about how important they are. Such a cool program. We've had Jackie Litskus, who's been involved in Algonquin research. Uh, old, old friend. The things near yeah. Sudbury, like just the, the coolest stories. Toronto Zoo is a really stalwart example. They do a lot of great turtle stuff. I really encourage people to check that out. Um, David, time flies and you're having fun. We've got time for about two more questions, uh, which is a, a good problem to have. I'm curious, you know, you, you focus so much in the end about this, this cross-cultural connection. How can some of our classes get us start in this? Again, we've got groups set to join from across three provinces today. Wherever you're joining from across Canada, how can you go about making sure that you're working towards, I, I don't know, understanding other cultures, their approaches to things, and, and especially with regards to biodiversity and conservation? Thank you. Uh, that's a daunting question because, again, I don't want to make suggestions that would leave people frustrated or would feel inappropriate. The basic, most important thing is get to know somebody else. Um, it's really hard these days with the COVID situation around the world and in Canada. But in the summertime, uh, before COVID struck, one of my favorite things to do would be to go to a powwow, which is a, a festival put on by an Indigenous community Usually they're open to anyone who wants to come out and speak, enjoy, get to know, talk. Um, the most important thing we can do as human beings is talk to other human beings and to be open to their experiences, their ideas. Um, you don't have to judge them. You don't have to try to say, well, my idea is better than yours. No, your ideas are wonderful, but so are theirs. So um, again, I can't speak for how a classroom would do this. I'm not a teacher but reaching out to local classes that are, uh, for example, on, um, uh, on, on reserves and finding out what the, what the kids are doing, maybe making a relationship from school to school to share and, and, and have cultural learnings that way. That, that'd be how I'd get into it. You, you know, again, I, I thought about beginning to that, you, you, that's the, that's the perfect answer. Talk to people. It's something that we're sort of, I, I think, losing a little bit amidst 
indeed virtual programs in, in some cases. Um, certainly COVID has made it very difficult to do this in person a lot. I'm glad we're in a situation where we're starting to have more of these opportunities safely because of a lot of great things going on in science in the world. Um, but talking to people is huge. And I mean, you've really embodied this your entire career. I've had the opportunity to hear you speak at the Explorers Club, talk about this in other formats. And it's a uh, Really, really special what you've had the chance to do personally, what the World Botanical Garden stands for. And I, I think that applies whether you're a class or whether you're eight or 80. Uh, that is something that, that applies and is a really meaningful answer. So thank you for that. Um, I, I, geez, you know, I normally wrap up a broadcast with a sentiment like that because it's fantastic. But is there one last thing for, for classes to take away from this broadcast that you highlighted so, so much today? I would encourage all our groups to head to the website, rbg.ca, to go to the Royal Botanical Garden in person. Our folks in Guelph today, you guys certainly have that opportunity. It's close by and a really special place. But how else can we keep the learning going, David? Hmm. Great. Again, a great question. Learning never stops. You come out of a classroom at the end of the, of the school year or the end of the day or the end of a program, and that's great. That means that you've you've had a shared experience, you've learned, your brain is bigger now. But you will never, if you stay curious, if you keep looking, you will never stop learning. There's always more to know. The most important thing you can do is, is get out there and learn. We have people at RBG who are volunteers who are in their 80s and their 90s, and they are still so engaged with nature and with people and with plants because they share their passion, they get together. A great place to start are things like nature clubs, um, uh, you know, Guelph Nature. These guys have people of all ages, all walks of life, whether you're interested in plants, animals, birds, rocks and minerals. My first exposure to nature study was gems and minerals. It, there, there's, there's too much to learn. You'll do it an entire lifetime and you'll love it if you do it. I've got a, a mineral right here. I was going to say one of my first experiences was a bunch of shells and a bunch of things like this that I had as a boy. And it was Section so geode. There you go. Yeah, it's gorgeous, right? I've got megalodon teeth in the shelf behind me. I mean, so many kids connect to this idea of having something to actually hold and touch and play with. We had nature yes. sketch on earlier today, drawing, which is something accessible to literally everybody. Engage all your senses. There's Engage so many all ways your to get involved and, and excited about this. And, and David, your presentation highlighted that so, so well. I just want to thank you so, so much for joining us today for wrapping up our Nature for All Fest. I'd encourage all our classes, check out natureforall.global, especially their discovery zone with so many resources for kids. And as said before, rbg.ca, more cool stuff than you could possibly check out in a lifetime, uh, even in winter. I know botanical gardens, people think spring and summer. My first experience with RBG was for Christmas and it was an amazing experience. And so uh, I hope our classes get that chance. David, thank you so much. And 